So it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our second panel on the topic of game mechanics. Uh, so from uh, left uh, to right, we have uh, Nicholas Knuff, who is a faculty member here at Wellesley College and assistant professor of cinema and media studies. And Robin Hunnicky will be our first uh, presenter, who is an associate professor at UC Santa Cruz and the co-founder of the game studio Funa Funamena. Phenomena. Phenomena, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and I should have emphasized uh, to a greater extent uh, the first two panels were uh, intended to be conversations between uh, designers and writers. So Me Too uh, was here as our uh, visiting designer and Lee as a writer. So Robin is our uh, designer speaking on the mechanics panel and Patrick Jagoda is newly associate professor of English at the University of Chicago who will be as uh, functioning as our critic. Uh, so with that, I don't want to take any more of Robin's time and uh, thank you all for uh, joining us. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say thanks to um, the event organizers and obviously uh, congratulate them on a fantastic show. Um, it's lovely to be here on this Friday afternoon and uh, to think and talk critically about, about games. Um, before I talk, I wanted to give a special shout out to one of the MFA students I work with uh, at UC Santa Cruz, Marcelo Villanueva, uh, for his helpful conversations of late about uh, what it takes to conduct a values-based practice. Um, when I was asked to speak about Jason's work, I thought for a long time <laughs> about what to say, um, especially since he's going to be sitting here in the room um, and we've known each other for quite a while. Um, what does someone like myself uh, say about someone like Jason? Um, he's a one-man show, a game maker who does just about everything on his own. And I, on the other hand, engage in a deliberately team-based practice, um, setting direction as a CEO, the captain of the ship, the creative director or the producer, sometimes a designer, but usually on quite large teams. My largest team is over 100 people, and my smallest team uh, has been about eight. Uh, my work exists because I collaborate with others, and in fact, I thrive in groups um, where collective intelligence and creativity are raised because we work together, which means that I'm less smart than Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I need other people to do what I do. Um, for a little context, in addition to the work that I do as a game designer and producer, um, and an advocate for games and diversity in our profession, I am a professor and the director of the BA and R Games and Playable Media at UC Santa Cruz. And in that practice, I try to teach people that games and mechanics in particular allow you to express new feelings and can allow us to experience new narratives from new voices. Um, and the framework that I use to teach there is the MBA framework, which is my most cited academic paper, uh, thinking about how we can change our perspectives from being about the mechanics often to instead uh, the aesthetic outcomes that a game will produce. Uh, when I began my journey into game design, I actually began my practice with a group of fellow game developers who were frustrated um, around the same time as Jason was coming out of school um, with uh, what, we, what we saw as a very homogenous and very narrow games uh, industry. And we started getting together in groups um, and working on games uh, using a similar engine over a weekend on a thing we called the Game Jam, um, where we just figured, why not? Um, and that became something that is now a common practice. At the time that I first did it, we'd never done it before, which was really exciting. And in addition to that, um, I worked on a showcase called the Experimental Gameplay Workshop with some of those creators, which I now run. I've inherited all of the work. Um, I've been doing it now for 15 years. Um, and Jason has shown several games at the workshop, many of his games for the very first time. So my experience of working with Jason is often like, what's he going to let out of the package next? What's going what's to be unwrapped uh, in front of the audience? And this is a really uh, fantastic time for us, because in just that last 15 years, we've seen a huge amount of diversity in the space. Um, and so after some consideration, I decided that what I really wanted to focus on is how the mechanics of Jason's games reflect, uh, reflect investigations into the concepts of values, and how these mechanics also reflect on the idea of practice. Uh, I think that both of these words have a multi-layered meaning uh, in our venue, which is one of the reasons that games are such a rich form of artistic expression. And what's more, I believe that these two concepts interact across the body of work that we call games in a very interesting way. In Jason's work in particular, um, these two concepts combine to create a space of contemplation where we can think about our own choices and how we conduct ourselves in the brief time that we have on the planet and why we do the things that we do. 
Reflecting upon Jason's career so far, I have uh, had to acknowledge that uh, despite my own collective and somewhat commercially focused practice, I really do love the romantic notion of being someone alone at sea, someone isolated, deeply thinking about the games you are making. I also kind of like that we are both exploring mechanics that move beyond the status quo, taking what we like and leaving the rest behind. In other words, while our practices are very different, and the works that we produce from that practice are also very different, I can still identify quite strongly with some of the core questions that his work posed. When I began considering leaving graduate school in the early 2000s, um, I was in CS and robotics, um, to begin making games as a practice, I felt like this was a choice that I had to make. Specifically, I could stay in AI and take increasingly hefty grants from DARPA, working on war technologies like self-organizing robots and drones. Or I could go pursue a career in games, learning how to make them. But I realized after just a few years of engaging in that community of practice, and through conversations with people like Jason, and workshops and events like these, that there was another or in the room. Choosing to go make games as a commercially successful company or making games by myself with no funding and potentially no way to earn money in the long run. At the time, there were very few independent developers because platforms were so constrained by publishers. But it didn't stop people like Jason from going for it, and for that, I have a lot of respect. I don't think it's an exaggeration to suggest that this was a pretty big leap for anyone who made it, especially anyone who had a family. And what's interesting to me is that many indies who emerged at this time chose to do yes and development, which I think Mitu uh, referenced in the last panel, focusing on genres that were successful and mechanics that were known in order to live their values. So these were one-person teams making smaller versions of things that were already pretty popular. But as we know, Jason walked in the opposite direction. When I look at the descriptions of the games in the show, I think what you see is the values of a person who wants to make a difference, but has to do it within the constraints of a person who also has responsibilities. The moment you get too greedy is the moment your hard work starts to unravel. What I love about the games in the show is their ability to immediately and clearly draw parallels to the choices, hard choices, that we make every day without taking themselves so seriously that they are uninteresting to the curious children in all of us, including the third graders that we heard about just now. And when you think about choosing to play with the child who inspires you, choosing to do the work that you can get money for that will help you feed the child that inspires you, that's a pretty interesting dynamic. Especially given the context of the practice, working from home, balancing the needs of creative work and parenting and being a spouse. It's not a competitive game. Your success depends on the other player's success. It isn't surprising that many of the game mechanics create dynamics where there is great tension between what one wants to do, what one should do, and what ends up doing to win. I think this idea that we may live in a world where there's too much kindness resulting in hostility <laughs> or hostility resulting in a poisoned world and hospitable to us all could be seen as a metaphor for taking hard decisions that promote one agenda over another and trying to balance those two things out. Maybe it's not as dark as we think it is, or maybe it is. I think it's interesting that the way these games reflect upon the problems of life rarely present a clear solution or a goal. In a way, what I like most about his work is that it meditates upon our agency in ways that are so immediately apparent and yet abstract enough to remove the sting that comes from recognizing how small and insignificant each of us is in the scale of time, despite how important our individual struggles and dilemmas feel to us. By comparison to Jason, my work is Baroque. It emphasizes many of the aspects we see removed from his work, juiciness, physics, glitter. <laughs> Concepts of togetherness, friendship, everyone getting along despite their differences, which one could possibly position as being directly opposed to his dark visions or difficult anxieties 
that are reflected in the rules of these extremely metaphorical games. My work is informed by hands-on practice. I enjoy, in fact, I feel it is necessary to fold paper into shapes, to paint and draw and make sculptures. And in fact, my newest game is a beautiful musical sculptural VR toy. <laughs> it's all about the feeling and the feedback. And when you look at it, You can see that it's a world built to touch. It's supposed to look like a painting that came to life. It makes me giggle. And when I build these things, what I'm thinking about is how do I touch people? How do we touch each other? So in a way, it's all about the feedback and the feeling. And in a way, I think that means that despite our very different practices, we are both working, walking, rowing, sailing, to new places, which makes us the same. Off the grid, beyond the wire, to places where other developers wouldn't go, because it's unclear that these areas actually would sustain life. Literally, out into the wilderness, into the desert, into the middle of space, into oceans of unknown. I was mostly drawn towards exploring human emotions because I saw so little of that being done well interactively. Making games is difficult and time-consuming, and I couldn't imagine doing it casually. I couldn't imagine going through that lengthy process to make just another blank. Much more reasonable to make the world's first blank instead, I suppose. Call it a blue ocean strategy from an interview with first truth. These are values. It is our values that guide us in the vast space of possibility. It is our values that let us know that we are heading in the right direction and that tell us we are getting there step by step. Jason's games are a prime example of what living your values as a practice can produce. Whether you identify with the protagonist or empathize with the victims, understand yourself in the context of his narrative framework, or see them, as Mitu did, as a point to start off expressing your own viewpoint. You can sense that they come from an attempt to do this work from the heart of the value. In a world where distraction and avoiding reality can become increasingly attractive and equally dangerous, it is critical that we examine the work that we do and understand how it both reflects our models and our values and how it can enable us to have conversations about them, even when those conversations are a bit awkward. I personally realized that this is a false choice imposed by a framework from above that wants us to believe that we should cede the territory of commerce to those who don't support art. As platforms open up and creation is democratized, we have the right to publish and sustain. But even then, there is the call. A life dedicated to expressing, in this medium, concepts focused on how we experience our lives, how we view time, how we understand our power within an unfathomably vast universe, where we are as about as important as a speck of dust. That's something. That's a practice, I believe, that is worth living. And I think that Jason believes this, too. And for that, I thank you. Um, so as I set up, um, I, I'm a co-founder of a game lab at the University of Chicago where we make games with uh, youth of color on the south side about issues of sexual and reproductive health, but uh, the majority of my time I'm an English and media studies professor, and so that's the hat that I'm going to put on today um, with both the style and the content of, of what I talk about. Um, so in the academic field of game studies, I'd argue that there are two primary approaches that have dominated game analysis in recent years, and these theories tend to explain how we might derive meaning from the video games that we play. Uh, so arguably, the most influential theory in some ways has been proceduralism, at least in the circles that I travel. People like Janet Murray, Ian Bogos, Noah Wardrop Fruin. Um, and Bogost, who's one of the most vocal uh, theorists of proceduralism, defines a procedure as, quote, a way of creating, explaining, or understanding processes. And process, processes then, in turn, 
define the way things work, the methods, techniques, and logics that drive the operation of systems, from mechanical systems like engines, to organizational systems like high schools, to conceptual systems like religious faith. So basically, proceduralism then says that you can discover the meaning of a game by thinking about its form, its structure, and its rule systems. So if you understand the rules of a game, you understand what the game is trying to tell you. Um, so before I get into Jason's games, of which I'll give several examples, we could, as an example of this, take the single-player turn-based video game Peacemaker, uh, which came out of Carnegie Mellon in 2007. Uh, so th this game puts the player in the perspective of, of either the Israeli prime minister or the Palestinian president, and Peacemaker produces a system in which the player's success or failure hinges on a multifaceted political ecology. So actions reveal implicit ethical arguments, right? So actions like delivering a peaceful speech or uh, establishing a welfare program are more consistently rewarded uh, in terms of score than kind of militaristic responses. Um, you know, even more explicitly, the game kind of posits a two state solution as the ultimate goal, revealing a particular set of political assumptions. So once you figure out those rules and the reward structure, you understand something key about what the game means or what the designers were trying to convey. So this is a pretty cerebral form of, of meaning making. Um, you know, and one sees an emphasis on procedure process and proceduralism in some of Jason's games as well. So, you know, one way to read a game like Crude Oil, for instance, uh, using this. So, so Crude Oil is a, um, was Jason's first two-player two uh, game, a prototype that's played across a network connection, and each player takes the perspective of an oil company that has to balance between <coughs> extracting oil and selling it immediately, or else withholding the oil and selling it at a higher price later. Uh, so you're making these kind of like temporal financial decisions. And during each turn, you bid on uh, the, the lease of plots from which to pump oil, and the oil that you pump enters into your, your supply pool in the market, and if you run out of money during the game, you can't act any longer and you lose. Um, so you know, this sequence of moves tells you something about the underlying system. Uh, you know, more than, say, the graphics, the rules give the player a basis on which to make sense of the game's meaning. Um, you know, and we see this kind of thing in other games as well, like Diamond Trust of London, for instance, of, of Jason's. And in both of these games, too, it's interesting um, that you're playing from the perspective of, of people who are in power, right? You're playing as an oil company, or you're playing as a, as a diamond corporation. So the procedural rhetoric depends on the rules, but also an acknowledgement that you, as a player, inhabit a different part of the modeled system outside of the game, right? You're much more likely to buy gas for your car or, or diamond ring than you are to manage this kind of system. But the abstraction, the high rules, still teach you something crucial in the process. So the second major approach to game meaning, and, and Me Too was, was uh, gesturing towards some of this earlier as well, um, is something called the anti-procedural or play-centric approach. Um, so one of the, the recent people to write about this is Miguel Sickhart, but this goes way back into play studies through people like Jay Hoitzinger and Brian Sutton Smith uh, in anthropology, for instance. And you know, Sickhart goes as far as to as this claim that games don't matter, that only the forms of play that emerge from games matter. Um, and he argues that a consequence of proceduralism, the first system that I was talking about, uh, is that it grants you know too much power and influence to the designer who produces the system. So the player then enters the role of exploring and basically reverse engineering that system sufficiently to unpack its meaning um, and figure out what's inherent to it. And Sickhart argues that the limitation of that method is that it marginalizes players in the ways in which they, they play by stipulating that, that all the meaning is already there before you even, you even touch the game in some ways. Um, so for him, the rules matter less than the ways in which players interpret, test, and transform systems. So just to read one quotation from, or a couple quotations from his, uh, his book, Play Matters, he argues that system-centric design thinking, the idea that because system, games are systems, they are important, is contrary to the way these systems are experienced. Game systems can only partially contain meaning because meaning is created through an activity that is contextual, appropriative, creative, disruptive, and deeply personal. Games are props for that activity. Uh, then he also argues the designer of games uh, should not act as a provider of anything other than context. You know, we see this kind of thing all the time. Probably the most obvious examples are open-ended simulations like the Civilization games or sandbox games like the Grand Theft Auto games, which are kind of possibility spaces, right, which is a term that's used a lot in game studies in which players are trying on and in inhabiting different identities and different trajectories through a possible space. 
But you see this in games that aren't open-ended in the same way. So one example would be uh, rocket jumping in Quake or Halo, right? So using something that was intended as a weapon in order to gain um, elevation or acceleration um, and move to parts of the level that the designer might not have entirely intended. So I think you know you could also read a number of Jason's games in terms of this play-centric approach. Uh, I mean, I think one of the most obvious examples would be Sleep is Death, which was uh, which Lee mentioned before. So this game, right, it, like doesn't offer a, a wholly pre-authored play mode. You have two players who are telling a story together. The first player serves as the game master of sorts, who creates a narrative, sets out objects in the world. And the second player controls a particular character, you know, and responds with dialogue and moves through that world. Um, so, you know, Sleep is Death certainly uses processes to create a system of play. So, for instance, every player has only 30 seconds to make a move. So you could read it procedurally, uh, but by and large, it's, it's emphasizing playfulness and creativity through this kind of open-ended frame. Um, you know, another example would be the Castle Doctrine. So, um, you know, this was also discussed before. Uh, the Castle Doctrine allows many people to inhabit the same space together for extended periods of time. Uh, again, basically, you know, on, on one side you're securing and protecting your home base from enemy attacks. On the other end, you're trying to rob the homes of other players. And both modes require uh, creativity, but the home security mode in particular has inspired a lot of playful behaviors. So in the catalog that, that Michael and I put together of, of Jason's work, um, we do an interview with Josh Collins, who is one of Jason's top players across a number of different games. And this is a long quotation, but I want to read it because it really gets at the heart of this kind of like the kind of playfulness that is afforded through some of these games. So Josh says, probably our biggest discovery was how to build clocks in the game that would increment each time you made a step or used the tool. Uh, this was again in making the home base that would trap people coming into it. So my brother Joel came up with the initial discovery of their possibility, and I was able to come up with a practical design. Once we revealed our discovery to the community, it had a large effect on the game, and houses making use of clocks in interesting ways became common. Jason initially wanted to remove the possibility, but we were able to convince him that because of the large amount of space required to create a clock, they were not game-breaking. Through exploring the electronics, I learned fairly quickly that the possibilities in the game were countless. While I was active, I kept working on making smaller and smaller clocks and counters, and just when I thought I'd reached the limits of miniaturization, I discovered a way of making it even smaller. Just working on solving challenges, we set ourselves up with the electronics was fun on its own. Joel hardly even played the game. <laughs> so I like this in part because it's, I mean, it's interesting that the game became, in a way, secondary to the playful affordances of the system that Jason had set up. So in many ways, this accords with something like Miguel Sickhart's view. Um, okay, so to summarize so far, you know, we have this procedural approach, which focuses on rules, underlying systems. Then we have the play-centric approach, which focuses on what you do in a game. Uh, and I think <coughs> one thing that both approaches have in common is that they don't tend to focus on game mechanics in particular, even though game mechanics are parts of these conversations. Um, so like, whereas rules are nouns in some way, I think of game mechanics as verbs, right? They specify what you're doing. You jump in a Super Mario game, you shoot in a, in a first person shooter, and mechanics kind of mediate between uh, rule bound situations and the player's affective experience of them. So in game studies, mechanics uh, have a great deal to do uh, with how we make meaning. Uh, and mechanics don't merely define feelings, right? In the sense that jumping uh, may elicit, elicit one kind of bodily sense, whereas targeting evokes another, right? We could say that mechanics have, have affordances. They have many different ways that we can take them up. So uh, jumping might inspire elation, a sense of freedom, uh, curiosity, a sense of precarity. Uh, targeting, targeting might uh, you know, induce a sense of malice, of satisfaction, of the sense of connection to a target, which is the way Mackenzie Wark writes about it or a feeling of bodily extension through the world. So there are all these multiplicitous um, ways of thinking about mechanics. Um, you know, and when we think about mechanics, we could, for instance, take a, a, an example like blocking in a game like Settlers of Catan, right? Blocking another player from achieving what it is that they're trying to achieve through their, through their strategy. Um, and it's interesting that like, with an affordance like blocking, um, pe people oftentimes go to wasteful lengths <coughs> to negate a threat or regain a sense of safety, um, even if it's utterly futile, even if it's not the best strategy, right? So there's a kind of interesting 
series of affects that's, that's afforded by something like blocking. And blocking as an abstract mechanic is interesting to track across a lot of different games, right? It operates very dif differently in Sellers of Catan than it does in like a tower defense game or something like that. Um, you know, and in, in art games, and I'm, I'm kind of coming up to Jason's games at the end of this, um, you know, mechanics, like one of the most interesting places of experimentation in recent years has been precisely mechanics. So a game like uh, uh, Jonathan Blow's Braid, for instance, you can reverse time and manipulate the flow of time itself as a mechanic. And that produces an emotional reflection on issues of error, of forgiveness, right? These really heady, or, or not heady, but really, really emotional themes. Uh, and you ask yourself, you know, what, what, what would I be, what could I do if I could reverse time? And this is a game that both um, speaks to that at the level of, of personal emotions and feelings, but also uh, issues like the atom bomb and these kind of world historical uh, tropes. Um, and I'll bring this game up too really quickly because I think it's a really nice example of, of a game that distills something down to the mechanics. So this is a game called Hush, which is about the Rwandan uh, genocide, also not one of Jason's games. Um, but the game uh, concerns a Rwandan Tutsi mother who tries to calm and quiet a baby um, in order not to be discovered by Hutu soldiers. So basically the game's mechanic is noteworthy in the way that it simulates patience. It's basically a rhythm game like, like in a sense, Dance Dance Revolution or Guitar Hero, but it asks for, for a slow response. So letters re responding to song lyrics fade in and out, and you have to press the right key at the apex of brightness to calm the child and keep her from crying. And if you don't do that, you and the child are both killed, right? I mean, it's this extremely dark ending to a very short, usually like five minute game. Um, but the mechanic here doesn't represent anxiety, right? It simulates the very feeling of anxiety and marks the player more for that. Uh, and this mechanic also, I think, produces meaning by generating empathy and putting the player in this kind of precarious position of powerlessness, which is something that we don't experience very often in games, or more so, thankfully, because of, you know, Robin's games, Jason's games, and, and people in this room. So like in the midst of the discussion of mechanics, I want to highlight something that may seem basic, but I think is really important, which is the remarkable diversity of mechanics in Roarer's games. So in fact, one of the things that, that makes Jason so interesting as a designer to me is not necessarily his visual style, which is itself interesting in the ways the morning panel brought up, but, but it's, he also stands out for me in the range of mechanics in the games. You know, he doesn't keep to platformers or shooters or any one kind of game. Each game is, is a new kind of experiment. Uh, so just to take a couple examples to close things off, we could take the 2008 game uh, Police Brutality, which is again this kind of prototype that Jason made for the Escapist magazine. Uh, that was part of the game design sketchbook. You, you can play it in the gallery downstairs. Um, so basically, uh, Police Brutality is a point-and-click strategy game that thinks about um, possible approaches to limiting police brutality and the escalation of violence that accompanies it. And in this very short game, you're in a room where a public event is unfolding, and basically police infiltrate the event and begin to drag activist figures out of the space. And the room is filled with three kind of spectators who are terrified, so the red ones, um, those who may consider helping who are marked in yellow, and those who are ready to help who are, who are marked in green. And the player can only click on and activate spectators who are already ready to help, the green ones. And if you click a yellow icon above these figures, it allows them to shout and spread um, you know, this kind of message across the, the room um, and, and infect, inf infect other, other people to, to join, join the cause. Uh, so the shaft also attracts attention from police. So you have to very quickly move among different figures to distract or trap the police. I don't think I've actually ever trapped the police. I always distract them somehow. Um, but you can also move figures who are ready to um, help across the grid and, and, and block people. Um, so the mechanics in this game are really interesting and produce a variety of affects, right? So for instance, dragging the shot radius out feels empowering, at least to me. Um, and you get immediate feedback in the form of spectators who are affected by your yell. Um, so even though it's a single player game, police brutality simulates an atmosphere of collective action and the possible contagion of ideas. At the same time, the yell also attracts attention and causes the police to come after you. So this single drag and click elicits uh, empowerment, but also terror, right? So in this game, I would argue that it's the mechanics more than the rules or objectives or free play affordances that encourage the player to generate meaning. Um, the last example that I'll talk about is 
uh, the game, the game between, which I really like. Um, I mean, it's maybe one of the, the least played play games of Jason's. It's a, it's a two-player game, and at the beginning of the game, you, you find yourself in a world between sleep and waking, and the avatar moves across this horizontal axis in a bounded level. And at the center of the space, you discover a tower that's composed of colored tiles. And by pressing the S and W keys, you, which I, I guess stand for sleeping and waking or something like that, you move across these three dream worlds. And in each world, you have to generate colored blocks using this two by two frame uh, in an inventory of red, green, and blue blocks and, and match them with the corresponding slots. And uh, you know, the goal of the game is to complete the towers, which also produces this kind of layered um, soundtrack. Um, in, in an introduction to the game, uh, Jason requests that the two players play in different rooms or not look at each other's screens. Uh, so without the, uh, the information of what's happening on the other person's screen, um, you have no way of knowing necessarily that it's even a two-player game or how it's two-player. Um, as it turns out, it's you know, neither competitive nor cooperative in the ways that most games are. It's, um, uh, you know, to steal Ian Vogo's term again, it's a form of disjunctive multiplayer. So the other player is affecting the things that are available in your in inventory that appear on your screen. Um, but in this very indirect way. So, so again, you affect what's going on, but you don't necessarily know how. So the game ends up being this kind of interactive mediation on interdependence and intimacy at a distance, uh, even between strangers who are linked uh, via computer network. Um, and and a, a number of these mechanics stack up to, to produce this, this kind of complicated, often very frustrating uh, meditation. Uh, anyway, there's much more to say about uh, game mechanics and Jason's games, but I'll, and here I think uh, uh, Jason's work is so important, again, in part because he plays with, with mechanics that are as abstract as, uh, you know, ones that evoke perfectionism or idealism, but also things as specific as the blood diamond trade in, in Angola. Um, so these mechanics um, evoke and explore these ideas, um, and that's a large part of what I think makes them so compelling and meaningful to players. Thank you. Great, great. Um, two very, very interesting presentations and a lot of stuff for us to talk about together. And I just want to start off with a couple of questions and then I'll quickly open it up to all of you because I'm sure there's a lot of things that you want to ask our speakers. Um, and even though I may direct questions at one of mm -hmm. you, hopefully, both of you can join in, and if Jason, you want to join in too, you know, <laughs> I think you could do whatever you want. Um, so, and, and and this question goes to something you you began with, um, Robin, and this may be a place where Jason wants to join in as well, because you're talking about sort of the relationship between solo practitioners developing things and the your interest in collaboration and groups, and you use this word smartness, and I want you, <laughs> and 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 I, and I want to unpack that because there's very different um, skills that are required to do these things, different types of smartness overall. If we're going to think about it on a continuum, and and that might tie in as well in in some of your comments later in your presentation about tactility, yeah. right, and how you can keep some of that tactility when you're managing a team of 100 people versus if you're doing it yourself, you're dealing with that tactility all the time, including dealing with missing a semicolon and your code not compiling and having to deal with those sorts of complexities. So yeah. maybe you want to. Yeah, I mean, I think actually uh, the way to put it is that there are multiple types of intelligences. There's, you know, body intelligence, and body has many brains, and all these sort of things. And so um, it's sort of taking the piss to say that Jason is smarter than me, although also kind of not. I mean, I think there's something there's something very difficult about engaging in a practice where you are the person that puts all the boundaries, you are the person that, that makes all of the mistakes, and you are the person that's responsible for all of the commentary and all of the all of the response. Um, it's difficult to be a solo creator for certain reasons. Um, it has its affordances, obviously. Um, you don't have to tell anybody why you want to do something. Um, and I'm pretty good at that now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I also think that um, there is something really valuable about being someone who can inspire the individual to take risks. And I think there's something very important about, as a community, 
letting everybody know that you don't just have to be able to do it all yourself. I think, in a way, even though I am a person who knows that my practice is more valuable because I can get to work with people like Kate Takashi and Claude Hernandez and all the other fantastic art directors that I work with, I, I hire artists, as, as, as Frank said. Um, I mean, I can draw, but I can't draw that well. You know, I mean, my 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 concept arts are, you know, it's it's effective, but it's not it's not something that I would want to expose everyone in the world to for hours and hours on end. And like. I know that that practice is more valuable, and yet there is something, and I wanted to kind of get out of my talk of like, we idolize, and it, and I think in some ways lionize these people who, who have the strength of will and the stubbornness, maybe, or the the passion. I mean, it, you can you put different words on it to organize and compartmentalize their lives so that they can engage in this kind of practice. And I think Jason can speak to it himself, but he's made some very explicit choices about how he lives, where he lives, what he does day to day, how he engages with his family, um, how he engages with his, his fans, um, to sustain and develop a practice that is in opposition to, in many ways, um, the patriarchy. And I think that's hard to do. It takes effort. And yes, maybe his backpack had more privilege in it than some others at times, but I think in the end, once you get out there into the desert, that doesn't really matter. It's only what you remember to bring, you know, and what you have the fortitude to find when you're out there. And I think that's that's a challenge. It's really a challenge, and I, I have a lot of respect for that. Um, at the same time, you know, I want people to understand that not all of us have to do that. There are other smaller, but just as meaningful sacrifices to be made in collaborative work, um, in engaging a community, in becoming a professor, in teaching, in becoming a coach, becoming a mentor, reaching out to help someone in pain. These are all things that. Um, that happen day to day on, on collaborative teams that I think are, are somewhat, um, they're, they're missing in somewhat from solo practice. Um, and they simplify that practice, but then they also, they, they divide it in a way that makes it very different from what I do. So that was what I wanted to get to without holding force for too long because it's, you know, it's Jason's thing. So I, uh, I wanted to uh, sort of respond to Robin's uh, point about me being, I guess, me being brave or whatever. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. So just uh, as a counterpoint to that, I got to see Robin's office for the first time. I was at a party at, at, yeah. during GDC where I uh, came to this really kind of amazing office in San Francisco and all these people buzzing around working on more than one project in parallel in there and all this concept art on the wall and everything. And I was like, how long have you been in this office? And I think you said like five years, something like Three, this. Yeah. Three years. I mean, some number of years. It wasn't like a new office, right? Yeah. And I was like, I walked away from there thinking, wow. Robin is the, the exact thing that you're thinking about me is like Robin is really brave. She has so much. She had to like fund this office in San Francisco for this number of years, working on these very risky projects with all recruiting all these like you know high value employees. Um, this is not a cheap endeavor here. And I was talking to my friend Tom, who was seeing the office for the first time. Who's my new collaborator, my new game. Um, you know, like wow, like I would be terrified <laughs> <laughs> to like you know take investors' money, have an office hire all these people and have all of them depending on me and my vision, you know, and like this seems like takes guts, like I would never be able to do this, right? So it's like from the other side of like the, the fence, it's like that, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm not taking, like, you know, I'm <laughs> like have my friend, my, my lifelong friend working on my next game with me and I'm literally paying him like $700 a month <laughs> to just barely buy groceries for him while we do this very risky project on our own. But like, there's so little risk, right? I can I can put out Cordial Minuet and it can lose $14,000. And it's not that big of a deal, right? <laughs> because they don't have like a whole company right. Jonathan Blow puts out The Witness and it loses money. Like it's like the end of the world for a lot of people, not just him. Um, Thank God that everyone bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Patrick, do you want to talk about working with communities and? Yeah, I, I mean, I've my, my my practice has always been uh, collaborative. I mean, so we have a, we have a very small team, and we're making games that are much more on the educational end, not on the art art end. So we have basically have one person per role, you know, developer, maybe a couple of designers, somebody working on graphics, somebody who's working on uh, optimizing things. Um, but you know, I I, I, I super admire uh, Jason's work in part because I've never been brave enough to to pursue that kind of auteur practice. But similarly to Robin, I mean, I find it extremely uh, rewarding to work with other people and to have so many of my, my blind spots caught along the way. I mean, I find it very educating in real time um, 
you know, to, to be reminded of what I'm not seeing and, and vice versa to have these kind of ongoing uh, conversations. And I guess maybe to pick up on this again, this question of how, to, how does one remain tied to the game and feel it when you have a very large team and you're managing it or you're trying to teach you're in an academic situation you're also trying to teach people how to work with these tools how do you actually stay attached to it the, 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 both of you do you want to no you go first okay. um mm -hmm. I, I mean for me you know part of the answer to that is that like pedagogy pedagogy research and design are very closely tied to one another. I mean, part of what our lab does is like, I, I'll teach courses on say digital storytelling or critical game studies. Uh, and many of those students will go on and you know, work with us on, on projects. Uh, you know, we'll make small games, oftentimes board games, card games. You know, we're working on some digital stuff now. But we also have researchers who will come in and evaluate the effectiveness of that game according to different rubrics, again, because these are games that are supposed to have learning outcomes around, say, sexual violence education and things like that. Um, so for me, it's, it's interesting to, to also just see, um, see that entire process and see the integration of students, designers, faculty, which is unique to, to university. I mean, it's very different from the kinds of games and practices that we're talking about here for the most part. I mean, yeah. Rob, Rob, you're a little closer to, to both sides. I guess I would say that the, the thing that I try to do is um, there's, a, there's a, a really great book <laughs> called <laughs> Leadership and the One Minute Manager. It's from the 80s. It's a little thin book that they gave out of the at a management seminar that I was asked to take by my manager at EA, which meant I was forced to take it. Um, and, uh, and in it, there is some really interesting and simple, but I think profound conversation about the difference between a structure in which a person is at the top of a pyramid and explaining things to everyone, and a person, a structure uh, uh, which is much more like, I'd like to have a phenomenon where you're at the bottom of the pyramid, and the leadership, it, sees itself as being responsible to and for everyone in the organization thriving. And um, actually, Marcel and I have been having this conversation. Um, he's been doing an intervention in a, in a games program, an after school program in Watsonville. But we've been talking a lot about the idea that there's actually a third diagram, which is neither a pyramid in one direction or the other, but it's a wave. And so if you imagine the pyramid, and then you take that dot, and at the beginning of the process, that dot is me supporting everyone, telling them what the vision for the game is. And then as the process moves forward, I move to a different place in the triangle. Like maybe right now I'm doing some concept art so that I give it to Glenn and he can do some environment art. And then maybe over here I'm building a marketing plan. And then back down here I'm doing some scripting. And then I go back down and we have an offsite. I tell everybody how to think about the character design of the game. If you look at that in time, it's me moving around like this. Like my level of authority and support, whether I'm delegating, coaching, supporting, directing, you know, I'm moving along this wave. And everyone else in the pyramid is also moving in that way. So the process is one of sort of like a flock of fish swimming together or a flock of birds swimming flying together. And I think the way you stay connected is that you stay present in the process and you understand that like at this moment in time, the most important thing for me to do is to create a shared vision from everyone about how we're going to communicate these inner inner worlds of these characters without language, in a way that leaves enough room for everyone else, like you were saying, um, uh, Sickhart's uh, quote, that you know my job at that stage is to create enough context for the player to insert their own narrative. Much as the, in, in, in Journey, a lot of what I did was move around in the organization trying to create space for conversation about leaving space for the player. Because our design intuition and our at least my own, I can't speak for everyone, but my own drives are to solve and to uh, to design and, and particularly to curate. I, I'm, if you've ever been to my office or my house, you'll see that it's just a massive collection of objects. I find objects to be very pleasing and I, I find myself surrounding myself with things. And so when I when I'm in a problem space, I find that I think of all of the problems as objects. I want them arranged in certain orders. I, I need conversations to happen in certain order. But then I specifically have a lot of strong intuitions about how I want the, the player to experience it. And so over the years, what I've learned is to divest myself of that urge and to share that urge with everyone. Because depending on where you are in the wave, when you get that question, you get a different type of answer. So a programmer may create very valuable space for players in the system. An artist may create variable, very valuable and important space for people in an animation set, 
giving the character a little bit more openness, a little bit more breathing room. And so that's really how I stay in touch with it, is thinking more about where in the pyramid am I at this moment, and what's the most important thing for us to facilitate, so that in the end, there's a context that is appealing. Um, and it's, yeah, it's very bizarre, the idea of selling an appealing context. Mm -hmm. But, that is, but that, I believe that is what I am trying to do. Right. Um, so, thinking, that, that sort of thing about game development as its own mechanics and how that functions, but I was thinking also about sort of the going back to the mechanics of the games themselves, and you said this interesting thing at the end of your talk, Patrick, and you can chime in too, Robin, on this as well, is thinking about, um, you're talking about the mechanics of Hush versus DDR, they're both sort of rhythm games, right? But they are obviously very different sort of emotional experiences of playing those games, right? Um, Hush for some players can feel very powerful, but it can also feel very manipulative, right? And then DDR is of a very different thing. And it's, and what's interesting about that is, I don't think it's, it's just due to the rhythm right. of it, or in the sense of the, the, the speed of, of what's going on. So I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit more about how you can have basically the same mechanic, an abstract mechanic, right. And then have these very very different experiences with it. Right. I, I mean, this this was kind of the, like even with the basic example of, of jumping, right, or, or something like that. Like, I mean, in, in Super Mario World or something like that, right. I mean, like, again, when 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 you jump, even even in a single game, right. I mean, there is a sense of like, you know, freedom or, or flying in a game like that, mm -hmm. right. I mean, like, like being able to just explore the space and like play around with your cape and be able to swoop and move around. Uh, but also like when you're trying to get through a level say, with a speed run or something like that, then, then all of that becomes very precarious. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're not an expert player or you're, or you're trying to get your time up at a kind of early early moment. Um, I mean, with, with Hush versus DDR versus a number of other games, I mean, there's also a question of, like, duration. And maybe this can get us back to Jason's games as well. I mean, especially the kind of the, the earlier games are all um, very short. I mean, Passage, for instance, which, yeah. which Me Too was talking about before, um, you know, and potentially some of the other games as well. I mean, Transcend can can extend out for a longer period of, period of time depending on how skillful skillful or not you are. But but I think you know there's a kind of potential power in a game like Hush or Passage uh, because of how short it is too. <coughs> it kind of distills such mm -hmm. huge themes within the course of a very small world in the course of five minutes. And this is not to say that like long experiences can't be. Um, really emotionally impactful. I mean, I, I design mostly alternate reality games, and those can last weeks at a time or months at a time, and you're really trying to achieve something very different in that kind of context by creating a world that people are inhabiting um, over the course of a, a very long period of time. So again, like it, it's just there are different affordances um, with, with mechanics and also with the duration of different games. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Can I, can I, can I jump in on the duration question, actually? Yeah. So one of the things that really, um, drew me to Jason's work uh, was the idea that like, you know, there's, uh, there's a game, there's play, and there's sort of like a magic circle that it's contained within. It's representational, but it's not somehow uh, plugged in or touching the rest of the world. But a game like Inside a Starfield Sky has a duration that actually is itself modeled on the actual age of the universe. Mm -hmm. And to me, there's something like super, super interesting about the mechanics of Jason's game actually starting to touch a real world impact. And then the same thing with Cordial Minuet requires actual money be actually risked in order to play that game. Great, so let's open it up to people from the audience. Anyone have any questions? <laughs> I have a question about the. Oh, this is something else, but I have a question about the idea of risk. Um, you know, you talk. You mentioned that you know you're brave. You're taking like these uh, risk. Could you, I guess, put into context what an example of what risk would be, like as a game designer? Like, as a or, game designer, or as well, a, as a okay. Um, there's there's very practical risks. Like I want to make a game about what it feels like to give birth. I'm going to make a very interesting, mechanically tight very, very well-tuned, graphically beautiful game about pushing a body out of your vagina into the real world. <laughs> and it's going to have real blood, and it's going to have real doctors, and we're really going to do it. That, I mean, that would be a really brave thing to do, because you would release it, and there would be a lot of things that people would say about it. You would know that when you took it out into the real world, uh, that some people might find it uh, violent or triggering, some might find it sexual in some creepy way, you know, there's there's all kinds of stuff out on the internet, right? And like in the end, if you were to really say like, no, I really I really want to represent the beauty of birth, but I also want it to be real and like physical in a way that like matters. And then you, so let's say you were a man. 
or you were transgender, or you were a woman who'd never had a child, mm -hmm. then you add a layer of political risk on top of that. Um, what if uh, you took that game and then you showed it somewhere and small children saw it and they had, didn't understand yet how rare babies came from because they were raised in a household where they were told they came from the store? And that, you know, I mean, there's all kinds, and then of course, I mean, are you going to charge money for it? Are you going to be able to put it up on the app store? You know, these are all questions that come from the idea of engaging in a practice of like, no, no, I really find this fascinating. Like, I personally find this fascinating. I have no, I have no children. I probably will never have kids. But I think that I've, I've read a lot about the politics of birth and cesareans and class and race structures related to birth, especially in the you know in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when we were when we were evolving birth technologies. I'm really really interested in the idea of premature births and the care of young babies that wouldn't be able to survive except for medical technology. But Am I going to make a game about it right now? Probably not, because it would be it would be beyond the envelope of the sorts of risks that I take. Um, but my friend, I <laughs> gave a talk at GEC of all these awesome game jam games she wants to make, and that was one of them. Uh, she was at a game jam and she wanted to make a game about giving birth to a baby. It ended up being a racing game where you're trying to race a woman to the hospital before she <laughs> popped a baby up. <laughs> that was the amount of risk that her team was willing to take with her on that, on that journey. So I think those are all those are all the sorts of there's practical risks, there's artistic risks, there's political risks, there's the performance risk of actually you know making a game about a subject. Um, many of my games are influenced by life experiences that I don't particularly share because I don't necessarily want to say, you know, oh, this game is representative of what it feels like to get divorced, or this re this is representative of what it feels like to, you know, to lose a friend to heroin overdose. You know, like I mean, but I have had those experiences, and like you know, they're they're not pleasant, but they inform my work. But there's the performance aspect of getting on stage. You know, when you talk about your design, how deep does it go? You know, I mean, that's, I think those are, and I think it's it's just like any other art form in that way. I was just curious with the, the when you're designing mechanics for a game um, and you're trying to sort of impart this feeling or ac access this feeling, whether you look at it as I want to make my player experience uh, impatience or uh, different feelings or I want, or if you look at it as I want them to access these certain feelings that they've had before, and uh, and look at this game in the context of their life, and how you balance those those two things. How you mechanics? Um, I mean, I mean, for, for for me, I again think about about it in terms of affordances, right? So it's very hard to create a mechanic that everybody will receive in the same exact way. I mean, this is again true of all art forms, literary forms, right? Anything you write, anything that you create visually, mechanically, is going to be picked up in all kinds of different contexts. And to go back to Robin's uh, previous point, I think there's maybe like, there are greater risks sometimes with a game than with a novel. I mean, with a novel, it's long, it's, you know, based in language. Of course, people like institute censorship and like resistance in all kinds of ways. Lolita, Huckleberry Finn, right? There are countless examples of this sort of thing. Um, and and those forms of censorship happen because a work of literature can be received in a whole bunch of different ways and evoke all kinds of different feelings, depending on your political background, depending on what other literature you've read, and so on and so forth. But with a game, I mean, especially a five-minute game, but, but even not that, um, Right, you you have some kind of immediate access to it. Right, you don't have to get through 20 pages or 50 pages to have a sense of the world that you're in. Um, you can sit in you know, sit in front of the screen. You already see the kind of um, the visuals, and then move around a little bit, and already you're feeling these things um, that are that are afforded by the mechanics. So again, I think like for me, mechanics like open up a range of possibilities, and that range of possibilities, like you can never guess what it'll be in advance, right? You can play test the game, which, which most designers do, and that'll give you a, a larger range than your own design team or, or the individual designer. But it's not until, you know, like weeks later or months later, I'm sure, you know, Jason has interesting stories about this, that, you know, players will come back and discover things about the game that weren't necessarily intended or, you know, the designer didn't even know were there. Oh. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I want to get into those kind of stories, those war stories. Right now. I mean, yeah, it, it's true. Yeah, there's uh, I mean, obviously, and, and Robin can speak to this through uh, years of industry experience and uh, independent studio experience. Um, you know, play testing. I mean, in fact, at the party I was attending, yes. uh, people I didn't I was standing in line and never got to actually try the game. 
but uh, people were play testing and she was, you know, she and other designers who were working there were eagerly listening to people describe exactly how they felt uh, in this VR experience and so on. And, uh, yeah. and yeah, I mean, it's, it's clear that it's pretty hard to predict. I mean, I guess maybe if you get more and more experience as a designer, it becomes a little bit easier, but especially for me as I was coming up as a designer, um, very sort of surprising ways that people would read something that I thought was should be obvious about like what object was the most important object to pay attention to or whatever and after watching someone play test it I you know instantly had very simple things that I could fix um, that would you know clarify something that I was assuming would be clear yeah you know I just did a play test for something that I'm working on that's not announced but involves an alternate reality component so we brought a bunch of people in and they were using it and the technology was such that we could change things in the design as we were playtesting. And I was really not a fan of this idea. I, I really actually, there's a part of playtesting and exposing people to design to see what they see that is so eviscerating. Like there's a really funny, there's a funny picture of a person trying to drink out of a cup by like putting their mouth at the bottom of it and like kind of like doing this. And like that's kind of how it feels. It feels like, no, you just turn, just put your hand on the handle. Or, but, you know, but it's one of those things where, you know, in a new world, you haven't grown up as a child and been put hand over and over on the handle and taught these affordances. So, so for a lot of people, they're they're blind in the space and they're they're wandering around. And there's something about it that's actually really important, I think, sitting with it and seeing it. But it's so terrible. Like it really feels. It makes you feel like like. People came over to your house for a party, and then somehow they ended up doing taxes. You know, and you're just like, how did that happen? Like, this is a disaster. No one is ever going to come back. You know, and you're like trying to give them, you know, I don't know, cheese its and beer, and they're like, this is this place sucks. You know, and like, I, I really, really, but sitting with it is the way that I think you do you do find your way to that feeling. Of, you know, with the, the example I always use in this conversation with Journey is that for a long time. Um, we had this problem where we wanted people to move the, through the world together exploring and to create this unique connection between strangers. But we had this mechanic where you could move to a thing and then get something. And we used it as like glitter. Um, when we translated the game from a 2D prototype to a 3D prototype, we found that we had to create what Walt Disney referred to as weenies uh, in the landscape that were like kind of glittery distances so that you could, oh yeah, we got to go over there to that set of flags. And um, in the game, it would be that the first person that got there would get them until you know, we realized at some point that we were inadvertently causing people to constantly compare the length of their scarves with each other. Why is theirs longer than mine? And um, it was really bad. And so eventually we had a couple of ideas. One of them, which was Genova's idea, was to make it so that everyone only had a wallet that held 20 bucks. So there would be money everywhere, but you could only ever take 20 bucks with you. That was the first idea. And then the second one that came through more playtesting was um, that I suggested that you not remove the items from their world, just yours. So when you play with someone, it looks like they're leading you goodies. And those two things transform the experience, like in a major way. And they seem so obvious, but it took us like a year or two to figure it out of just people competing with each other and not getting along and not having a unique experience, but not the experience that we wanted them to have. Um, and so simple things like that, the movement mechanics, the way that you don't stand up and start moving until you face the mountain, all these things that we, we determined almost entirely through playtesting and having really, I think, difficult conversations with ourselves about why we suck so much. Question? Um, I guess I was interested to hear a little bit about kind of the genesis ideas uh, of the games that um, you all work on and whether they come from uh, from a feeling or from a game mechanic or what kind of what drives that initial uh, inspiration for you? Mm. Uh, I think I already sort of spoke to this, but I, I am in particular always thinking about uh, people, relationships, and the way that we interact with one another. Like I'm incredibly sensitive to everybody's vibrations, I guess. I have really long antennas. And so whenever I'm in a city, you know, I the first thing I do is walk around and see all the people. And, I look at the shops and the way people dress and I, the food they eat. I try to understand like what's the vibe, you know? And so my games are kind of always about processing, I don't know if you could call them observations, but intuitions about why we do things. 
And so when I started working on Luna, the question I asked everybody for like a year was, why do we do things that we know are bad for us? Why does little red riding hood talk to the wall? Like, he's clearly not a cool dude. <laughs> he's definitely not somebody you can bring home. You know, but she still talks to him. It's like, hey, mommy, let's have a chat. You know, and we all do it. Like, every one of us has done things that we knew in the moment were going to produce potentially disastrous results. Like, what if a partner walks in on us? You know, that kind of stuff. People do it all the time. And we know we're not supposed to do it, and we do it anyway. And like, why? You know, and so, like, for me, literally, I spent, like, when I was after Journey, when I was folding paper and thinking about Luna, I spent a year just going to people at bars and randomly in conversation asking that question. And then writing a narrative and thinking about the story that I wanted to tell about my own mistakes. So, that's it for me. Jason, you have like a place where your ideas come from? Um. <coughs> Yeah, so uh, I guess I uh, I I want I like there was a, some quote I guess from the interview uh, yeah. that Patrick and I uh, uh, conducted that uh, you know I talked about how uh, you know I've made uh, 18 games or 18 uh, computer games and then a couple of other games that are sort of more off computers uh, and I work on my 19th computer game and uh, each one is such an arch like such a <laughs> process right it's like I think about Comparing it to like painter who had made 18 paintings or something, and when you talk about like, you know, uh, coming up with this idea in a couple of weeks on paper and then launching off on this year and a half, two year long, in very arduous engineering project to get this thing, you know, up and running and working at all, and you can't just sort of like, kind of improvise along the way or kind of do it half. I mean, it's like it's like sort of like trying to you know, improvise a uh, working automobile or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, just don't improvise it. You have to, you know, engage in pretty rigorous engineering to make a safe functioning, uh, be a, a safe functioning machine. And and so that process is so intense and so long and so drawn out and so becomes such a drudge toward the end um, to get through it and finish it and ship it once you're tired of working on it. Unlike, you know, I, I mean, some painters who are doing very meticulous, very tedious painting probably experience something very similar. Um, and maybe novelists might experience something yeah. similar. Um, but uh, it's just so, um, yeah, so draining, basically, that I feel like I really need to figure out, like, what is worth making a game about, right? I spend a lot, oftentimes spend a lot of time um, between games just like, hey, I finished a game, okay, what am I going to work on next? I don't have like a folder full of ideas because the idea I, I work on has to be something I'm currently passionate about or else there's no way in hell I'm getting through that two year process. <laughs> if it's a little idea that I came up with two years ago that's sitting on a design folder and like it's kind of cooled off, like it's just not going to happen, right? So I then give myself like sometimes a couple of months until I come up with an idea that feels like, oh my gosh, this is the idea that I have to make. Uh, and where is that idea coming from, which is your question. Um, that is coming from you know stuff that's important to me, right? Stuff that I am thinking about otherwise in my life, stuff that I'm talking with friends about, stuff that I'm marveling about, stuff that I'm going through emotionally. I mean, over the course of my career, you can see all these different kinds of things. Like I'm thinking about this thing that's going on with my family and my relationship to my kids and my relationship to my work, or I'm thinking about the passage of my life, or I watched Don't Taste Me Bro yeah. on YouTube and was like just uh, uh, just horrified by the fact that people are standing around this guy. Ah, this is happening. Why are they doing this to this kid on the floor? They're tasing him and all this. He didn't even do anything. He was just asking John Kerry a question. He wasn't even like being belligerent or anything. And now he's getting tased, and we're all just standing here, like you know. And I said, you know, I've had people watch this video. I was like, I would have done something over there. And like, you don't know what this is like. No, you wouldn't have. You would have just been just as petrified as everyone else. And I'm like, no, man. I would figure out how to organize the crowd and stop the police from doing, you know, like. And so uh, that that emotion that, that stirred up in me, you know, it was just a YouTube video. It was a, it was a meme, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, it was enough to make me feel like I had something to say about it, or I wanted to talk about, well, how could you handle the situation in a way that didn't get yourself tased too, right? Um, so uh, and then you know other games that I've made about you know philosophical things that are really interesting to me, or like the, the game that I'm going to demonstrate later on today uh, that I'm working on, um, uh, you know, is about sort of big philosophical questions that I've been discussing and are, you know, thinking about for a long time and are having arguments with friends about for mm -hmm. yeah, five years or more. We have time for one, oh, no, we have, we we have no time. Oh, we have a puzzle so. 130, that's right. <laughs> thank you all for okay, Thank you, thanks for the time.